All right, chemistry 3101. This is chapter six, which deals with chemical reactivity and mechanisms. And we're going to start right off in section 6.1 and talk about enthalpy, which is something that you would have discussed in general chemistry one, and you would have looked at in even greater detail in general chemistry two. So just to recap or to refresh your memory as to what enthalpy is, right? You know the symbol H that we use for enthalpy. Um, enthalpy which is Q at uh, um, constant pressure. So enthalpy, delta H, is the heat energy exchange between a reaction and its surroundings at constant pressure. Now, keep in mind that organic chemists, yourselves included, you know, when you step into an organic chemistry lab, organic chemists generally run their reactions at constant pressure. Yes, I know that you look at constant volume reactions in general chemistry, but in organic chemistry, we're only con concerned about um, reactions that occur at constant pressure. So you know that um, uh, delta H is going to be equal to Q at constant pressure. So if we think about the electrons that are involved in a bond, right? We spent quite a bit of time in chapter one talking about bonding, right? We said that if we have two electrons, let's say in a hydrogen atom, they come together in a bonding molecular orbital, which is lower in energy, right, than the two unpaired electrons. So it stands to reason that a, since a bond is lower in energy, if we want to break a bond, it's going to require an input of energy. So the whole take home message from this slide is nothing more than this. When we have unpaired electrons, they come together in a bond, right? They have a lower potential energy, and therefore it's going to require more energy or it's going to require energy to break the bond right because they att attain a more stable um a more stable environment when they're in a bond all right so if we have to break a bond well how do we break a bond well there's a couple of ways that we can break bonds we can break bonds homolytically or heterolytically so homolytically is what we're mostly going to be concerned with here in this chapter Homolytic bond cleavage involves the formation of two radicals. So you know that in the bond, there are two electrons, right? Every bond has two electrons. Well, you see these arrows here, these are called fish hook arrows. And a fish hook arrow represents the flow of one electron. I know I've mentioned this to you earlier on, but again, it represents the flow of one electron whereas a double-headed arrow represents the flow of two electrons. So the bottom line is, since we have two fish hook arrows, you can see that each atom in that bond is taking one of the electrons to form a pair of radicals. Remember, a radical is a species that has an unpaired electron. There's also heterolytic bond cleavage, and we look at plenty of heterolytic bond cleavage in organic chemistry. However, when we're evaluating enthalpy of a reaction, the values of bond dissociation energies or the amount of energy that's required to break a bond, those correspond to homolytic bond cleavages. Now, where would you look up the values of bond dissociation energies, right? The amount of energy that's required to break a bond. Well, you'd look it up in a table, right? Now, this is a table that uh, comes from our textbook. It's table 6.1. This is not the complete table. The complete table is found in your textbook, and I probably will refer to it in a question uh, today, so you might want to have your textbook open somewhere. But uh, here we have a table of bond association energies. I don't expect you to memorize any of these, but you have to know how to use these bond association energies, right? You see that there's many different types of bonds to hydrogen, aren't there? You could have an H2 bond. You could have the bond between hydrogen and the carbon and methane. Look, the bond between a hydrogen and the carbon and ethane has a different bond association energy. So not all H carbon bonds are alike, right? You can see that they differ greatly. Anyhow, here we have the halo acids, for example. Here we have the bond between a hydrogen and an oxygen in water, right? And then we have some carbon-carbon bonds. You can see that the carbon-carbon bond um, dissociation energy in ethane is different than that in propane. So what's the take-home message here is that we have all these different types of um, uh, bonds, and we look at their, we'll look up their bond association energies. I think another take-home message from here is that, you know, it might be a knee-jerk reaction, if you didn't know, to think that all carbon-carbon bonds would have the same bond association energy, but they don't, right? They, they vary, okay? So something to think about there. Again, a more exhaustive list can be found 
in table 6.1. So what have we got so far this morning? We've got that when two electrons come together to make a bond, they achieve a, a, a more stable state or a lower potential energy state. Therefore, it stands to reason that it takes energy to break a bond. Okay, well, how much energy does it take? Well, it takes a certain amount of energy that you can look up in a table like this one here, this table of bond dissociation energies. These values, all these numbers that you see on here, these are all associated with homolytic bond cleavages, right? That result in the formation of two radicals. So um, this is an even more exhaustive table. I took this out of a general chemistry textbook because I know that some of you probably, probably remember using bond dissociation energies to calculate delta H of a reaction, right? And we're going to look at that again uh, this morning. So again, here's a more exhaustive list. You know, kind of interesting things that you could maybe point out here. And I mean, this is the kind of table we could sit here and talk about it for an hour probably, but we don't have that kind of time. But look, if you look at a carbon-carbon single bond, right, and then you look at a carbon-carbon double bond, and then you look at a carbon-carbon triple bond, what do you notice? You notice that the bond dissociation energy increases. That goes all the way back to chapter one. We didn't quantify it in chapter one, but we did say that as you form more bonds, the atoms get closer together, and so there's more orbital overlap, and therefore the bond is going to be stronger, right? And something like that. You know, you could do the same thing with a carbon nitrogen bond. Look, there's a there's a double bond here, or there's a triple bond here. Uh, what else? There's a single bond here, and you see the same trend. Anyhow, all kinds of interesting trends that we could spend time looking at here. But in the interest of time, let's move on. So reactions, the rest of this class, the rest of organic chemistry one, pretty much all of organic chemistry two, with very few exceptions, uh, we're just going to be looking at reactions, right? Chapter seven, it's the wheels start turning and they don't stop until, you know, you finish the organic chemistry. So all these reactions that we're going to look at in organic chemistry, oxidation reactions, reduction reactions, right? We're going to look at, you know, carbon-carbon bond formation, carbon-carbon bonds being broken, right? Bonds between carbon and oxygen. Anyhow, I could sit here and talk about that all day, but the reactions, what do they involve? They involve bonds being broken and bonds being formed. And so the total change in enthalpy, right, the delta H total is referred to as the heat of reaction. Now, you should remember endothermic and exothermic reaction, right? An exothermic reaction, again, chemists like to look at the system, right, the reaction. An exothermic reaction is one where energy is released, Right? It's released from the reaction into the surroundings. In the case of an exothermic reaction, the products are going to be more stable than the reactants. Now, if you're wondering, are we going to look at uh, an energy diagram? Yes, we will in a second. An endothermic reaction is one where the energy that's required to break all those bonds is more than what we get back from the new bonds that are going to be formed. So in that case, the products are less stable than the reactants. Now, if you're the kind of person that needs to have, or likes to look at things in a graph, and there's a lot of people that are like that on the planet Earth. Um, here are some energy diagrams for exothermic and endothermic reactions. We have the exothermic reaction over here. You can see you have the starting materials. They have a certain amount of enthalpy, right? We break all those bonds and then we form new bonds when we make our products, but you see the products are more stable, right? than the reactants. If you remember the calculation that you would have used a lot of times in, um, in general chemistry was what? And I'm not going to write up the exhaustive formula here, was that the delta H of a reaction was equal to the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients of the heats of formation of the products, right? Minus the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients next, or multiplied by the heat of formation of the reactants. Again, that's what you would have used in general chemistry, and we're not really going to use that formula a lot in this class. However, we can use it to, you know, quantify why this is a negative number, right? So if you're taking products um, and you're subtracting reactants, well, if the numbers are increasing going this way, right, what are you doing? You're taking a small number, oops, you're taking a small number here, right, something lower on the scale here, and you're subtracting a bigger number. If you take a small number and you subtract a big number, what do you get? You get something negative, right? So that's why an exothermic reaction, the delta H is negative overall. If we do the converse, right, if we do the opposite in an endothermic reaction, your products have a higher number, 
So we're taking a big number and we're subtracting a smaller number. Well, we're going to end up with something that's positive in that case. So that's an endothermic reaction. What's the take home message from these um, energy diagrams, right? Well, in an endothermic, or sorry, an exothermic reaction, the products are lower in energy. Endothermic, products are higher in energy. Energy gets released as heat in an exothermic reaction. Energy is getting consumed, right? Um, in an endothermic reaction, what? Delta H negative, positive, right? And in an exothermic reaction, you think of exotherm, right? You're losing heat. So that means that the temperature of the surroundings is going to increase. Remember, chemists are always looking at everything from the point of view of the system or the reaction. All right. Anyhow, so that's endothermic and exothermic processes. Nothing really out of the ordinary there. However, what I want you to know is that in this class, we're not going to use this formula to calculate delta H of a reaction. Okay, because we're not going to use heats of formation, are we? All right, if you go back to this table, okay, there was no heats of formation in here. Okay, that's something that you would find in the appendix of your general chemistry textbook. What we have here are bond dissociation energies. Okay. And so we're going to use a different strategy for calculating the delta H of a reaction. Now, I teach general chemistry, so I know that you would have seen this in your general chemistry class. The way that we're going to do it in organic chemistry is this. And again, you would have done this in general chemistry. But the delta H of our reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the bond association energy of the bonds broken. So we'll put um, bond enthalpies of bonds broken broken minus the bond association energies or the bond enthalpies, whatever you want to call it, of the bonds formed, okay? Now, why would you write it that way, right? It's because you're putting in the energy to break the bonds, but when the bonds are formed, you're subtracting, right? Because energy is released, okay? When we're forming bonds, we're releasing energy. When we're breaking bonds, we have to put energy in. Now, I've gone ahead here. And I've uh, looked up the values in table 6.1. But the question says, using the data in table 6.1, and again, I think you might have to go to the actual textbook to get all the values, but I'll write them down. It says, predict the sign and magnitude of the delta H naught. Okay, and this is just standard state, so it means atmospheric pressure and everything's in its standard state. Uh, for the following reaction, identify whether the reaction is, is expected to be endothermic or exothermic. Okay. So what are we going to do? Well, what bonds are being broken and what bonds are being formed? I'm going to use the red pen to represent what's being broken. You can see that this carbon-hydrogen bond, right, there are two carbon-hydrogen bonds here. I'm aware of that. But we only have to break one of them, right? We're breaking this carbon-hydrogen bond, right, because we're replacing it with a bromine. And they don't have the Lewis structure of bromine here, but I'm going to draw it out. So Br2 is this, okay? and we're breaking the bond between the two bromines, right? If you look at all the other bonds, you can see that there's three bonds to hydrogen here, right? There's three bonds, right? We're not breaking any of those, okay? There's a bond to a hydrogen here. We're not touching that, okay? We're not touching any of the bonds here. So I'm only concerned with the bonds that are being broken. Well, what's the bond enthalpy or the bond association energy for these bonds? So I've gone ahead and looked it up. And the value of this carbon-hydrogen bond is 397 kilojoules per mole. I'm not going to use the kilocalories. The bond association energy for the bromine-bromine, we could even go back here because I think it was in the table. No, that would be too simple. But anyhow, the bond association for the bromine-bromine, you know, bond and molecular bromine, if you look it up in the table, is, what was it? It's 193 kilojoules per mole. All right. Well, what's the bond association energy um, associated with our products? Well, what's the bonds that are being formed? I'm going to use the green pen. You can see that I'm forming this carbon bromine bond. OK, it's got a bond association energy of 285, so 285 kilojoules per mole. And my hydrogen bromine bond in HBr, is that even that one in there? Again, I didn't copy the whole table because it's kind of annoying. Okay, here you go. There you go. HBr, 368. So let's go back here. We'll put that in. So we've got um, this bond has a value of 368 
kilojoules per mole. Well, let's plug everything into our formula so that we have the delta H naught of our reaction is going to be equal to 397 plus 193 subtract 285 plus 368. All of this, I'm going to put all of it in big brackets, is kilojoules per mole. All right, remember, the reason that these are positive values is because it requires energy to break this bond and break this bond, All right? So these are bonds, bonds broken. But remember, when we form bonds, we release energy, and that's why I have a negative sign here, All right? I could have put subtract 285, subtract 368, but I put it all in brackets here. These are the bonds bonds formed put another way and i'm kind of repeating myself here so energy energy required okay and then here energy is being released released all right there we go so if you break out your calculator okay and you do the math here which is just some addition and subtraction you find that you get uh, 590, 590 kilojoules per mole, subtract 653 kilojoules per mole, and then you find out that your delta H is equal to negative 63 kilojoules per mole. So is this an endothermic reaction or an exothermic reaction? It's not, it's not a trick question. Yeah, thanks, Mackenzie. It's an exothermic reaction. Yeah, nothing more than that. Okay, so exothermic. Exothermic. Okay, I'm not trying to sound like a meanie or anything. Sometimes people think I'm trying to be mean, but I'm just telling you that in general chemistry, you would have done this. Okay, do I expect that you remember every single thing you ever saw in one class? No, of course not. But I'm just telling you, you know, if you needed some more information about it, if you have your general chemistry notes, you could probably go back and find, you know, okay, well, I evaluated delta H using heats of formation that are found in the appendix of a general chemistry textbook. You won't find those in the appendix of an organic chemistry textbook. The reason why, if you're like, well, why would they have it in one textbook and not in another if you're doing the same type of thing? The reason why is because there's so many organic compounds that we use the bond association energies, and sometimes we just use average bond association energies. So actually, and, and the book doesn't go into detail about this, I'll just say it quickly, that using this method will give you a value that's not going to be as accurate as if you used actual heats of formation, okay? And again, that's covered in general chemistry, but the only way you're ever going to be asked to calculate um, the change in enthalpy for a reaction in organic chemistry would be this way, okay? Wouldn't matter if you took this class, organic two, advanced organic chemistry, whatever, you always use this way, all right? And again, I uh, um, assigned some questions from the book, or not assigned them, right word, I hand selected some that are in the suggested problems where you do the exact same thing. All right, just one more thing I'll mention about this in case anybody's wondering, and hopefully nobody is wondering this, but uh, I remember doing this with a general chemistry class one time, and a student told me that they had taken the class, you know, I don't know, with another instructor, or maybe at another school, which is, is no problem with that whatsoever but they said you know what they did is they broke every single bond in this right and there's only one bond here and then they formed every single bond in this okay and this one obviously but literally they broke every single bond and i'm like that's cool it will work it will get you the right answer for sure but it's a lot of work that you don't have to do right because you're not breaking any of the bonds here 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 and you're not breaking that other carbon hydrogen bond so you can just ignore those all right, anyhow, just kind of a uh, thought there. All right, so that covers our enthalpy, delta H, or uh, the variable H that we use for enthalpy, right? E would just make too much sense, right? Anyhow, let's move on to entropy, right? There's too many words to start with the letter E, so entropy we use delta S. You know, if you think of entropy, what's entropy, right? A messy bedroom, that's what I always think of entropy. I can never seem to doesn't matter how much I clean it, you know, it always seems to just get disordered, right? You think about cleaning your kitchen, you know, they say that once you become a parent, I feel like my life is work and cleaning the kitchen, you know, it's all I do is clean the kitchen. But if you think about cleaning a kitchen, for example, and I'm sure that's something you've all done, um, 
when you clean a kitchen, there's really kind of only one way to put everything back in its place, you know, and so that it's nice and tidy and everything. But if you think about the number of ways that you can mess it up, there's an infinite number of ways that you can mess it up. And you ever notice that something becoming messy in your house happens spontaneously, right? It just happens. You don't have to do anything, really, or it doesn't feel like you do. It just spontaneously becomes messy. But when it comes to ordering it, that takes energy. So that's kind of what I think about when I first think about entropy. So let's get back to entropy and thinking about it in terms of chemistry. So we looked at exothermic reaction. So an exothermic reaction is when the delta H of the reaction is negative. An endothermic reaction is when the delta H of the reaction is positive. And the thing is, you might think, well, if it's an exothermic reaction, like an explosion, you know, boom, it's releasing heat into the surroundings. That's a spontaneous reaction. Well, the, the truth is both um, exothermic and endothermic reactions can occur spontaneously. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the deciding factor as to whether a reaction is spontaneously going to occur or not is not simply governed by enthalpy. Okay, you have to consider both enthalpy and entropy when you want to predict whether or not a reaction will occur, whether or not it's going to be spontaneous, right? So recall that entropy can just be described as disorder, molecular disorder, randomness, freedom, right? The, the kind of messy bedroom I was talking about, right? Just total chaos, right? Um, a process that involves an increase in entropy is said to be spontaneous. So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say here, and I know that you've all passed general chemistry too, right? So you know where I'm going, and that's to Gibbs free energy. But the bottom line is, from general chemistry, we all know that in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, the overall change in entropy has to be positive. So in fact, entropy is the ultimate deciding factor as to whether a reaction will spontaneously occur or not, okay? Now again, I know that we're gonna package entropy, we're gonna multiply it by negative delta T in a few minutes and get Gibbs free energy. But again, Gibbs free energy is nothing more than a way of expressing entropy. So how, you know, what do we have to consider when we're talking about entropy in this class, right? This is the class you're taking in. This is the class you want to get a good grade in. So what do you have to be concerned about as an organic chemistry one student? There's two things that you have to consider when you're talking about entropy. And we'll look at a practice problem in a second here. Okay. And I, I think that most students will be able to wrap their head around this pretty quickly. The first one is when there's more moles of product than reactant, right? So if you start with something that's just one mole, okay, and you end up with more moles, two or three or four, whatever. Well, here there's only one way to organize this because A and B are attached to each other. Sorry. Here there's only one way to attach those two molecules or there's only one way to view them, so to speak. Whereas in the products, they're separated. So now I have two separate things. Well, there's more possible ways that I can organize two things than one thing. Therefore, the entropy is increased, okay? The other possibility is, and this is something that we'll look at, you know, from time to time in this class, is when you have a molecule that's cyclic and then it becomes acyclic, okay? Because if you think about it, the number of conformations here is gonna be much less than if you have it acyclic, right? You just think about cyclohexane, and then if you were to take your molecular model of cyclohexane and break it apart and make hexane, well, that you can, move it around and twist every bond. So both of these mean an increase in entropy. So uh, let's write it here. So um, delta S is positive, right? Entropy is increasing here and entropy is increasing here. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on these two concepts because I want to take a look at a problem. Does everybody follow me? You know, you have one mole of something, you're making more moles of something. Well, there's it's going to be more disordered. And then if you go from something that's conformationally constrained, like a cyclic structure, then you have something that's just, you know, flopping around like an acyclic structure, then the entropy is going to increase. Great. Good. Okay. Let's take a look at a practice problem, right? Probably you've realized by now that the best way to get any concept in organic chemistry or any chemistry class for that matter to crystallize in your mind is to look at some practice problems. So let's take a look at these ones here. Uh, for each of the following processes, predict the delta, the sign of delta S for the reactions. In other words, will the delta S of the system, remember a system in chemistry is just a reaction, okay? That's your system. Uh, will the delta S of the system be positive and increase in entropy? 
or negative. So I'll just ask my students here. So delta S of my system, and if you just want to call it delta S, it's fine. But anyhow, would my delta S here be positive or negative? Could anybody tell me for A? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, good. Sorry, Mackenzie, I didn't think I could see what you were writing, but yes, I can see what you're writing. And you're all 100% correct. Yeah, it's negative, right? You're going from two moles of something to one mole of something. This is called a diels alder reaction. It is neither here nor there for you right now, okay? But this is a reaction that you'll see in chemistry uh, 3111. But you see what, look, we're only in chapter six of organic chemistry one, and you're already able to analyze an advanced reaction just by looking at, you know, okay, I've got two moles of this and I'm less, ended up with less moles. So the entropy is decreasing. That's kind of cool. Um, anyhow, I could also show you the flow of electrons for this, which is kind of neat. Okay. That's what we call um, a four plus two cycloaddition reaction. Anyhow, I'll delete those because it's not here nor there for us. Uh, what about the next one? What the next one? Delta S. I don't know why I keep doing that. Delta S of the system here. I have this tertiary alkyl bromide. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All of my students are correct, right? Because you're starting out with one mole of something and you're ending up with two moles, right? You're creating more chaos, right? The randomness or the disorder is increasing. So here we have positive. Okay. Everybody who answered those questions nailed them. I'm sure that my students who didn't even type anything, I'm sure they're following uh, along with me here. Okay, so we've kind of established uh, enthalpy. That was section 6.1, right? That's what we looked at in 6.1. We talked about delta H for a reaction, and we looked at how to evaluate that using bond dissociation energies. Make sure you try those practice problems, because I will ask you a question about that on the next quiz for sure, and quiz six anyway. I'll ask you a question about that. Um, and then in section 6.2, we talked about delta S. So we talked about entropy. Well, again, uh, you know where the story is going, right? You all passed uh, general chemistry too. So you know what happens after you talk about delta H and delta S. What do you move on to after that? You talk about Gibbs free energy. So the spontaneity of a reaction or a process depends on the total entropy. It depends on the entropy of not only the system, which is our reaction, okay? But it also depends on the delta S of the surroundings, which is like the environment. Yeah, the environment, okay? The environment that's around the reaction. So let's say you're doing a reaction in a flask, you know, you're in the lab, you're having fun, you're doing a reaction, you know? Well, it's not only the reaction itself, but there's also the, you know, the environment around there, and you have to be uh, or take that into consideration as well. What's cool about delta S of the system is that you guys know from general chemistry too that you can calculate delta S of the system by looking up values of uh, standard entropies from a table, right? And that's something that you would have done a pile of times in uh, general chemistry too is where you would have done that. But delta S of the surroundings, how do we measure the change in entropy of the surroundings. Do we actually just like kind of go around the flask and like what's happening over here? Well, luckily for us, there's a shortcut to it. And that is that the delta S of the surroundings is equal to the negative of the change in enthalpy of the system divided by temperature. Okay, so this is our shortcut here. Now, if we take this first equation, this beautiful equation right here, and we substitute this in for the delta S of our surroundings, what do we have? And you can see that they flip these, okay? They flip them over here. They put delta S of the system last. But anyhow, the bottom line stands, okay? So now we have the total entropy, okay? is gonna be equal to negative delta H of the system over temperature plus the delta S of the system. What have we done? We've defined the spontaneity of a process, right? Because we have to look at the total change in entropy we defined the entire defined the entire thing in terms of the system, which is our chemical reaction. Now we can we can handle that, can't we? Because we can evaluate the enthalpy of our chemical reaction. We saw how to do that, and we can evaluate the change in entropy of our chemical reaction. So how do we get to Gibbs free energy? Again, I'll rehash this uh, for you or refresh your memory. What do we do? We take this whole expression here that I have in the Maybe I'll change colors here. Let me use the blue pen, 
Okay, everything that I have in these blue brackets, you take the whole dang thing, pardon my language, and you multiply it by delta t. Then what do you get? You get negative delta t times delta s total is equal to the delta h of the system minus t delta s of the system. So again, what have you done? And I'm just repeating myself here. You've got the total entropy for everything, and that's the deciding factor as to whether the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. You got it all defined in terms of the system. And when you multiply delta S total for everything by, del by negative T, that is your delta G. So if you think about it, if delta S total was positive, that meant that our reaction was spontaneous, right? Okay, well, if you're multiplying it by negative T, that means that delta G, okay, is going to be, or yeah, negative delta, negative, if you're multiplying this by negative t, you get the delta g is going to be negative, okay? And this is going to be a spontaneous process, okay? So again, the delta g is called Gibbs free energy. A negative value means that the reaction is spontaneous. If it's a positive value, that would mean that this is a negative. So a negative times a negative gives you a positive. So there you go. So if it's a positive value, it's non-spontaneous. Gibbs free energy, you know, you might, if you were like, oh, I was intimidated by Gibbs free energy in uh, general chemistry too. I didn't like it or something. Well, let me try to make it as simple as I can for you. It's nothing more, Gibbs free energy is nothing special. It's really just a fancy way of looking at, at entropy of everything. That's all. It's nothing more than that. Okay. And the reason why it's so great is that um, we can define everything in terms of the system. Okay, that's another reason why it's so great, in my opinion. Anyhow, delta H, so if we look at our overall expression, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Um, the delta H represents the change in entropy of the surroundings, and the T delta S represents the change in entropy of the system. You know, normally, the delta H value is much larger than the T delta S value. If you don't remember that from general chemistry, no problem. But a lot of times, the delta H can be really much much bigger so that's why a lot of the time reactions that have a negative delta h right you think exothermic spontaneous a lot of the time they are really it's true a lot of the time they are but not all of the time and that's why we need delta g let me show you another nuance that is mentioned in our textbook i don't think i put it in the slides but you've you've probably seen this you know if you've ever looked at delta g anywhere uh, else before sometimes they'll write it like this they'll say delta g is equal to in our textbook does that does this um they'll say delta h plus negative t delta s okay so instead of writing it like this they'll write it like this which means the exact same damn thing and they and if you're like well why would they do that it just confuses me it's supposed to not confuse you believe me they're the, whoever does this their heart's in the right place they're trying to make it simpler for students they just want you to evaluate this and then this. And then I guess that maybe if something is added together, it might be simpler for some people. I don't know. But anyway, you see it written both ways um, when we analyze Gibbs free energy. Well, let's get back into our reaction coordinate diagrams here. So if a process has a negative delta G, the process is spontaneous and the process is called exergonic, right? So we have exothermic that relates to delta H, but for delta G, we use exergonic and, of course, endergonic, right? Notice that in this energy diagram, it's free energy right here, plotted against um, uh, the, re our, the reaction coordinate. Uh, it's not enthalpy, okay? So we're talking about uh, the free energy for the reaction that gives free energy. Anyhow, what do we see here? We know that delta G, and this, again, is from general chemistry, delta G is going to be equal to the free energy of our products minus the free energy of our reactants. And that's a real kind of shorthand version of the equation for calculating delta G. But the bottom line is this, okay? If it's products and it's a small number and you're subtracting a big number, well, you're going to end up with a negative number, right? Conversely, if you're doing the same thing for an endergonic process, you take the products, which are a high number, subtract a small number, and you get a positive number. So that's an endergonic uh, reaction. Going back here, something that I don't think I mentioned is that in an exergonic process, the products are going to be favored. 
Whereas in an endergonic process, the reactants are going to be favored. All right, well, let's move on from there and talk about equilibria. So again, this is a real hardcore general chemistry to topic, the whole concept of equilibria. And if you're wondering, you know, are we gonna look at kinetics too? Yeah, we're gonna talk about kinetics too. So the next two sections actually deal with equilibria and kinetics. You remember equilibria? Well, equilibria use big K. You remember K equilibrium? And in kinetics, you had a rate constant, but that's little k, that's lowercase k, right? This is section 6.5 which is where rate is equal to little k times, you know, concentration of reactant, right? That's something completely different, okay? That's kinetics. This chat, or this section, 6.4 equilibria, that, this deals with thermodynamics, okay? So again, we're kind of rehashing some topics in general chemistry too. And I know that some of you took chemistry 1411 with me just this past uh, uh, it's the summer, so spring semester. So, you know, you're going to hear me kind of rehash some of those topics, which always... It's always nice to review. Uh, so let's talk about an exergonic process, one that's spontaneous. Well, you might think, well, hey, if the reaction is spontaneous, I'm just going to get nothing but product, right? Everything's going to be converted into products. Well, what you're going to see in this class is we're going to look at all kinds of reactions, and we'll even look at yields. Sometimes they'll give you a percent yield in the textbook, you know, and ideally, you know, and let's just, I'm taking a quick break here with you, okay? I went to a conference, I don't know, a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, but I'm sure that everybody can relate to this, where you hear somebody say something and it just kind of sticks with you for the rest of your life. You just can't forget it. Well, there was a guy who was talking about chemistry who knew a lot more than I did. And, you know, he was kind of introducing his presentation, which was about the discovery of some new drug. But anyhow, he said something I never forgot because I was just a, you know, lowly chemist working in a company wearing my lab coat and safety glasses every day. And he said, you know what, you guys? The ideal reaction in organic chemistry would be one where you just pour all of the reactants in a bathtub, okay? You stir it around with a canoe paddle, okay? And then to collect the product, you just pull the stopper out of the bathtub and you collect it underneath with a Home Depot bucket, you know? <laughs> just collect it as a, as a beautiful, you know, a, a white crystalline solid or something like that, you know? And you get 100% yield. You guys remember percent yield from general chemistry? Well, unfortunately... In organic chemistry, many times our yields are not 100%. You know, sometimes they're going to be 90%, okay? Sometimes they're going to be a lot less than that. What if you only get 50%, you know? And that's something that all chemists battle with is going to be percent yield, and that's based on thermodynamics. All right. Um, I can't tell you how many times my boss would say, oh, can you make, you know, 10 milligrams of this compound, and then we're going to test it in a rat or a mouse or something. I'd say, no problem, boss. And then, you know, I'd do all my chemistry thinking I was going to have 10 milligrams and I'd end up with, you know, seven or something. Just, duh, you know. Anyhow, let's talk about an exergonic process again. Is every molecule of A and B going to be converted to products? Well, no, it won't. It depends. Well, usually no. Okay. Um, no, because an equilibrium is going to be released or reached. Um, now, why would that be? Because you're starting out with only A and B, but as the reaction progresses, you're going to get more and more C and D and less of A and B, right? So a spontaneous process, all it means is this. It doesn't mean that you're going to get 100% products or anything like that, like we 100% products. It just means that you're going to get more products than reactants. That's a spontaneous process, okay? So the greater the magnitude of that negative delta G, right? Remember when delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. The bigger and lower number that delta G is, the more products you get, okay? So I'll repeat that again. Your delta G, the value of delta G, you guys remember delta G is equal to negative RT ln of the K. Anyhow, if you don't, I'll, I think I have it on a slide coming up. But the lower the delta G value is, it just means you've got more and more products. Okay, so why doesn't if the product if the process is exergonic, but if the delta G is negative, why wouldn't it just give me all products, right? Well, again, and this is what I was trying to explain on the last slide is because you're starting out with just A and B, but what happens over time, right? The concentration of the A and B are going to drop, and the concentration of C and D are going to increase. So then you're going to get collisions between um, C and D, 
and then they're going to start forming A and B. So this is the reverse process. So at equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is going to be equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. The forward and reverse reaction rates will be equal, and that is our minimum value, or that's where we find our minimum value of delta G. And remember, the lower that value is, the more products we will have. All right. So if you remember defining K equilibrium, where do we get K equilibrium? Well, an equilibrium constant, our K equilibrium, we use that to show the degree to which a reaction or product, uh, reaction is product or reactant favored, right? I remember in general chemistry too, we did many questions like this where we said, okay, well, if you have a reaction where you have reactants, okay, uh, reactants that are gonna give you products, Okay, like this. Well, if the K equilibrium is the concentration of products over reactants, if K equilibrium is a number greater than one, let's say, would that be mostly products or mostly reactants? Could anybody answer that? If K equilibrium was a number, let's say, much bigger than one, let's say it was a you know 10 to the power of six or something, it's a million. Would it be mostly products or mostly reactants? Could anybody say? A number much bigger than one. I don't know if I, it's not working here. What? It might be a delay in the response or something here. But the bottom line is, if K is much bigger than one, yeah, it's mostly going to be products. Yes, absolutely, right? Well, why would that be? Because that would mean that the numerator, right, the numerator is bigger than the, 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 than the denominator, right? If you have I mean, just plug in some numbers. If you have 2 over 1, that equals 2. 2 is a number greater than 1, so that means the concentration of the products is greater than the concentration of the reactants, right? Well, if you have a positive number, okay, take your calculator if you have one, take the number 2 and take the natural logarithm of it. So 2 and then take the lump. You get a positive number, 0.69. You would have done that, you know, when you looked at half-lives and stuff. You would have taken the natural logarithm of 2. A pile of times, you get 0.693, which is a positive number. You take a positive multiplied by a negative, and you get a negative number. So you see how that when you have mostly products, you have a negative delta G. Conversely, if it's mostly reactants, let's say you had, you know, 1 over 2. Well, that gives you 0 0.5. When you take the natural logarithm of 0.5, so take 0.5, take the natural logarithm, you get a negative number. So then you have a negative times a negative, which gives you a positive delta G. So you can see the relationship between K equilibrium, okay, oops, I was trying to erase that, between K equilibrium and Gibbs free energy. Okay, that's all we're trying to establish here on this slide. So K equilibrium, delta G, delta H, and delta S are thermodynamic terms. They only describe the relative stability of products and reactants. However, they don't describe the rate at which they're formed, right? Because in order for us to understand the rate at which they're formed, that deals with kinetics, okay? And that is the next section. That is section 6.5. So 6.5, so something to look forward to, okay? Anyhow, well, again, rehashing what I was saying on the last slide. If delta G is a negative number, your K equilibrium is gonna be greater than one. If delta G is a positive number, excuse me, Your K equilibrium is going to be less than one. But in order for a reaction to be useful for you, if you want mostly products, well, you've got to have a K equilibrium that's going to be greater than one. And what you see in the textbook is there's a table, which I don't think, oh, yeah, it's on the next slide, which says that a small difference in free energy can have a huge impact on the ratio of reactants to products. Let's skip ahead to that. This table um, it says here that notice that just changing the value of delta G by six kilojoules per mole um, has about a 10 uh, times change in the equilibrium constant. So look, the bottom line is this. If you look at the values of delta G, you go from plus 17 all the way to negative 17. You can go from 0.1% to almost 100%. Okay, so the bottom line is that a small change in delta G, so if you have a change in delta G of about six, right, 
negative 11 to negative 17, it changes by the K equilibrium by a factor of 10. You go from 100 to 1,000, okay? Um, anyhow, what were the laws of thermodynamics? I just kind of threw these in here. Uh, number one, energy can't be created or destroyed, right? Entropy always increases, so that's delta G is going to be negative for a spontaneous process. And I don't know if you remember the third one or not, but it's basically the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is zero, right? There's no molecular movement at absolute zero. Anyhow, with all that, you know, if that's a lot of stuff in your brain, you're like, oh boy, I remember a lot of it, but I'm not sure if I remember all of it. Well, either way, let's take a look at a question here that involves, oh yeah, I have them on a few slides here. So let's look at a few questions that deal with um, thermodynamics. Okay, it says, in each of the following cases, use the data given to determine whether the reaction favors reactants or products. So you can see how this would lend itself to a multiple choice question very easily. Let's we'll start with A. So, hold on, where's my pen? There we go. So for A, if my delta G is positive, 1.52 kilojoules per mole, would that favor the reactants or products? Can anybody tell me if my delta G is plus 1.52? Yeah, it's going to favor reactants. Favors reactants. I mean, we know that just because the delta G is positive, and that's just a fact that you have to know. I mean, if you go back in the slides, I mean, I stated it here. Um, when delta G is positive, reactants are going to be favored, okay? But, um, you know, if you want to think about it from the point of view of delta G, you know, from delta G being equal to negative RT times the lawn of, lawn of K equilibrium, well, in order for delta G to be a positive number, right, in order for this to be positive, this is a negative, so that means that the lawn of K equilibrium has to be um, a negative number, right? Because you have a negative here. And in order for the lawn to be negative, the, the K equilibrium has to, be, has to be less than one. So that's another way to think about it. So what about B? I kind of answered B already, didn't I? What if your K equilibrium is equal to 0 0.5, right? Well, then your delta G is going to be equal to negative RT times the lawn of K equilibrium. So you're taking a negative right? You're taking a negative number and you're multiplying it by, take the ln of 0.5, right? Take 0.5 and take the natural logarithm. It's a negative number. So you're taking a negative times a negative and you get the delta G is going to be a positive number, therefore reactants again. And so the answer to the first two questions, or the, both of these questions, is reactants are going to be favored in both cases. All right, let's move on from there and try something maybe a little trickier. Uh, in C, we're on C, it says a reaction carried out, carried out at 298 Kelvin. They give you a delta H value and they give you a delta S value. So for that, we're going to have to use our formula that uh, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. We have our delta H. Now notice the units. Here we have kilojoules and here we have joules. I'm going to convert everything into joules. We should know that there are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. So I'm going to multiply this by 1,000 to convert it into joules. So I would have 33,000 joules per mole multiplied by uh, or subtract uh, T, which is 298 Kelvin, multiplied by my delta S, which is 150 joules per mole Kelvin. We go so you see that Kelvin cancels out here. We end up with our delta G. I already went ahead and did the math here. You can double check me, but I'm pretty sure it's right. Is equal to negative 11,700 joules per mole, which is the same thing as negative 11.7 uh, kilojoules per mole. So if delta G is negative, it's going to favor products. So we'll put here products, products favored. All right. 
Let's see, did I leave myself any other space? Oh, I did. Let's try D then. So for D, uh, and these are real, this is a real Chem 1411 classic, right? Both, um, both D and E. So it says an exothermic reaction which are, with a positive value for delta S of the system. So we're gonna use delta G, so this is D delta G, is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Our, if it's an exothermic reaction, right, that means that our delta H is equal to a negative number. So we have a negative number, subtract temperature, which is always positive because it's in Kelvin, and we have a positive value for the delta S of our system. We have a positive times a positive. That's gonna be equal to a negative, subtract a positive. And if we're taking a negative and we're subtracting a positive, you take negative two and you subtract two, what do you get? You get negative four. So that means that delta G is always going to be negative 100% of the time. Therefore, it's gonna favor, gonna favor products. Uh, and the last one is E. It's you've got an endothermic reaction, so your delta H is positive, and you get a negative value for delta S of the system. So here we have delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Our delta H is positive. We're subtracting a positive for our T. T is always positive, right? T always, always positive 100% of the time, right? Because it's Kelvin uh, and our delta S is negative. So negative, so that means we've got a positive subtract, a positive times a negative. So we've got a positive subtract a negative. If you take a positive subtract a negative, you've always got a positive number. So our delta G is positive. Therefore, it's gonna favor reactants. All right, there you go. Well, that covers equilibria. So what have we covered so far this morning? All right, section, oh, section 6.1, we talked about delta H. Section 6.2, we talked about delta S. Section 6.3, we talked about Gibbs free energy. So 6.3, we talked about delta G, so we put all that together. Then in section 6.4, we talked about equilibria. So we talked about K equilibrium, and we know that K equilibrium is related to delta G is equal to negative RT ln K equilibrium. And we looked at the equilibrium expression, which is the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants. Well, if you remember your general chemistry too, and again, I wouldn't expect you to remember everything that you ever talked about in general chemistry too. But if you remember a little bit, you know, you probably remember that after thermodynamics, we have to take you know, the speed of the reaction into account. All right, let's say we wanted to make a blockbusting drug that was gonna make us billions of dollars and we knew a reaction that could make that drug, but in, in everything, the delta G worked out, the delta G is negative, but what if the reaction took, you know, two years to do? Well, then it's not really useful for us, is it, right? We're looking for reactions that we can do in a short enough amount of time to make them useful. In, in order to evaluate the amount of time that it takes to do a reaction. What are we taking into account? We're taking kinetics into account. So remember that delta G only tells us whether the product is favored, whether the reaction is spontaneous or not, but it doesn't tell you anything about how fast the reaction is going to occur, right? You can have a spontaneous reaction that's really fast, like an explosion, right? You light a firecracker, pow, you know, it's very quick. You know, you shoot a, shoot a gun when the bullet you know, goes out as a projectile, you know, you're lighting the gunpowder, right? That explosion is really, really fast, okay? But um, there are other spontaneous processes that are really slow. You know, if you think about the conversion of diamond, which is just an allotrope or a form of carbon, if you think about the conversion of diamond to graphite, and graphite is not nearly as valuable as diamond, it's a spontaneous process. So, you know, the whole concept of diamonds to dust uh, diamonds are being converted to dust right this second. So if you have a diamond earring or earrings or a diamond ring, whatever, diamond in your watch, I don't know. But uh, the conversion of that diamond into dust is spontaneous. So you're thinking, oh no, should I sell it? You know, No, because the conversion takes millions and millions of years. So even though it's a spontaneous reaction, 
in terms of kinetics, it's not a very useful reaction, you know, or it just takes so long that we don't really have to worry about, you know, our diamonds being converted to dust in our lifetimes or anytime soon. All right. So the reaction rate, how fast does a reaction occur? How much time does it take for a reaction to occur? Um, it's the function of a number of the number of molecular collisions that are going to occur in a given period of time. And I'm reading off the slide here, which is affected by all of these factors. And again, we're still covering general chemistry too here, right? How fast does the reaction occur? Well, what causes a reaction? You have to have particles colliding. They have to interact with each other in order for the reaction to occur, right? You have to have molecular collisions. Well, what's going to affect molecular collisions? You know that the concentration of reactants is going to affect reaction rate. Why? Because if your rate, or sorry, if your concentration is increased, your reaction rate increases, right? Like this is an experiment that we can't do over Microsoft Teams, but you can imagine this experiment. I ask my students about this sometimes in the classroom. I'll say, okay, let's everybody, if everybody in the classroom, and of course we're not going to do this, but if everybody in the classroom was to stand up, close their eyes and start walking around, you know, are there going to be collisions between students? It sounds ridiculous, but yes, there would be, wouldn't there? Now, let's say we invited two more classrooms of people into the same classroom so that we had three times the number of students. And I said, everybody close your eyes and start walking around. Will there be more collisions? Yes, absolutely. So you can see that as we increase the number of particles per unit volume, which is just an increase in concentration, reaction rate is going to increase. We know that rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of reactants. And I know that you covered you know, zero, first and second order reactions and the rate laws in general chemistry too. We're not going to get into that in a whole lot of detail, but we'll get into it in, in enough detail in a second. So again, you can see here that rate is directly proportional to concentration. If the concentration goes up, the rate goes up. Next is the activation energy, right? The activation energy is that minimum amount of energy that's required for an effective collision to occur. Next, we have the temperature, right? As a student once uh, said in class, he's like, a thermometer is kind of like a speedometer for molecules, right? So as the temperature increases, molecules are moving faster. So we're going to have more frequent collisions and they're also going to have higher energies because the molecules are going to be moving faster. So temperature. The next one is geometry and sterics. That's really the orientation of the molecules. Now, all three of these, two, three, and four, these are all sandwiched together in the Arrhenius equation. So I don't know if you remember the Arrhenius equation or not, but I'll refresh your memory. It's that K, our rate constant, is equal to A times uh, E to the power of negative EA over RT. And I'm not going to ask you to apply that equation for anything necessarily in this class. It's more that you see how activation energy is affects the rate constant, um, how temperature affects the rate constant, and geometry and sterics, that's actually in this value right here, A. Okay, and what else do we see? We see that rate is going to increase as the rate constant goes up, okay? And then the last one would be the presence of a catalyst, okay? So we know that a catalyst affects the activation energy by lowering it and by altering um, the pathway by which the reaction occurs. Okay, so that's just kind of an introduction to kinetics.